Good afternoon and welcome to today's Mobility Innovation Pilot of the Month webinar. My name is Petra Mullet. I am the Vice President of Strategic and International Programs at APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, and I'm pleased to introduce today's topic. We're very excited to be focusing on the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority in Kansas City, Missouri, known as KCATA, and its microtransit services. Before I introduce our speakers, let me note that you will be able to find today's webinar, slides, and materials on the Mobility Innovation Hub on APTA's website, as well as on the APTA U page. You will also be able to re-watch this webinar and share the link with others. And while you're on the APTA Mobility Innovation Hub, we do encourage you to explore all of the other resources, tools, and best practices available to help you navigate the changing mobility landscape. Each month, we highlight a new and innovative approach to service delivery or technology deployment. And for each case study, we provide the contracts, data sharing agreements, procurement documents, promotional materials, et cetera, that might be useful, useful for you as you consider similar ideas in your own community. I would also like to highlight that the Mobility Innovation Pilot of the Month webinars are part of a broader set of webinar offerings available through APTA-U. This series will resume following our upcoming Transform Conference in New York City, where we hope to see all of you in mid-October. And it is in October when we will be announcing the next round of webinars, so make sure to check the APTA-U and the Mobility Innovation Hub websites for upcoming events. Let me now introduce the speakers for today's webinar. We have David Zipper, founder of DZ Strategies in Washington, D.C., uh, who will be acting as our discussion facilitator today. And we're very pleased to have Robbie Mackinnon, the president and CEO of KCATA, Jameson Otten, KCATA's vice president of regional service delivery and innovation, and Lisa Womack, who is the director of mobility services at KCATA. And I'm also very pleased to mention that we have a special guest today, Josh Powers, who's the business manager of public transportation um, at Johnson County, and they are running the regional microtransit services of which we will be speaking today. And now I'm pleased to introduce David Zipper, who will facilitate today's conversation. David? Thanks very much, Petra, and welcome to everyone joining the webinar today. Uh, it's good to be with you again for uh, another pilot of the month with APTA and uh, looking forward to diving in with KCATA on today's session. Uh, for those who have not had a chance to meet before, I do a lot of work with APTA here in Washington, D.C., where, where we're coming to you from right now, uh, focusing on transit agencies and new technologies and what can be learned from agencies that are a little bit ahead of the curve, just like KCATA is with, uh, with microtransit. Uh, next slide. And, uh, what I want to, before we, we jump in with the conversation, the presentation, just to highlight that uh, if you want to go deeper into the topics we're discussing here uh, about what's happening in Kansas City, there is a brief memo about three pages long uh, that is drafted and available on the Mobility Innovation Hub on the APTA site that Petra made mention of previously. You can go and access it there, and you can feel free to share it with colleagues and uh, friends, acquaintances who will be interested in this, in this topic but aren't able to join us in the webinar today. Next slide. And um, of course, this is for those who joined um, these webinars previously, you know that we try to make it interactive as we can. And there will be opportunities in just a short, short while for you to ask your own questions. In fact, you can go ahead and submit your questions now. You should see a box uh, right now on the uh, go to webinar um, sort of screen where you can type in a question. We will be collecting those and looking at them and be posing the ones that the top, we'll post questions based on the topics that come up most frequently uh, over, the, over the course of the conversation we're now going to have. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to our friends in Kansas City and invite you to first just sort of set the picture for us. What does public transportation look like in the Kansas City region? Sure. Thank you, David. This is Jameson, uh, ATA. Um, transportation in Kansas City is really provided under one umbrella called Ride KC, but under that umbrella there are uh, several different agencies themselves. Uh, the KCATA serves Kansas City proper, 
uh, the Streetcar Authority, the City of Independence, Johnson County Service, uh, we have Kansas City, Kansas Service, and also Bike Walk KC. So we're all co-branded under the one brand. Uh, we did that so that it was under, it was easy to be under, it was easily understood from the customer perspective, rather than having four different systems, four different schedules, different fares, different eligibility process for, for paratransit. It was really looking at how do we streamline things. Now, I know uh, transit folks are always interested in numbers, so we'll give you a few numbers. Uh, we have about 300 buses throughout the region, uh, about 75 different paratransit vehicles running around, and we also use a lot of taxis for our Freedom on Demand uh, taxi-based service for, for our uh, paratransit customers so that they have a higher level of freedom as they use the service. Uh, we do about 15 million trips a year uh, annually on the service. Uh, and, and as we see ourselves is we don't necessarily feel that we need to run all the services, but we feel that we're the integrator of services. And you'll hear that throughout the presentation that uh, throughout our service area, when you look at the different markets within it, different levels and different types of services are needed to serve the different populations. So we see ourselves as working with the different communities to provide help to implement the services that they feel work uh, for, their, for their populations and citizens. Uh, next slide. So uh, two, we have, we have several major initiatives that are going on right now. Um, I'm just gonna speak to two. One, of course, is gonna be uh, mobility services, and we'll look at it on this call through the lens of uh, microtransit, but we have also been looking at um, how, does, how do autonomous vehicles fit in, how do other um, on-demand based services fit in, particularly uh, through our Freedom On Demand service, um, how do uh, scooters and, and bike share play into this. Um, we're one of the few transit agencies in the country that have co-branded scooters, so when you come to Kansas City, you'll see scooters that have the Ride KC uh, logo on them. Um, we have, we just started a program called the Opportunity Pass, which is working with uh, safety net providers, and Robbie Mackinnon will, will hit on that here in a few minutes. Um, the other big thing that we're working on, which is, which is really the, the overarching thing, is the service redesign. We're really looking at how we deliver service throughout the region, how we balance coverage versus uh, uh, high ridership corridors, and then what are the pieces that fill in the gaps uh, that are uh, community-based and market-based and customer-focused? So that's where uh, we can talk a bit about microtransit, uh, how we went from one pilot uh, to another pilot, and finally Josh will fill in on where we are today in terms of what's going on in Johnson County. Can I jump in, Jameson? Absolutely. Hi, this is Robbie. Uh, just to kind of put a finer point on what Jameson was saying, look, um, what the KCAT was before is a bus company. What we are now is a transit authority, and there's a big difference with that. Uh, it, our region, just like most regions in the nation, uh, consists of a lot of different elements, uh, everything from urban to rural to, to county to country, whatever you want to call it, and, and the fact of the matter is, like with a lot of you, nobody wants anybody playing in anybody's sandbox, right? Well, our whole design from the get-go was to come under one brand, Ride KC, but still allow the autonomy of uh, counties and cities to say what they need. Who better to know what they need than that city or that county? Uh, so it's our job as the authority to help them get where they want to be and then help connect that to the rest of the region. Now, that has made a huge difference as far as input, as far as engagement and getting everybody on board, if you will. Uh, which has really been fantastic. And it allowed us also then to be very innovative and understand that there's not just one, it's not a one size fits all that works for everybody. You can't use a cookie cutter mentality. Uh, and with that, we're able to do like with Josh and Johnson County, uh, able to try these micro transit programs where you, you have a, a in depth redesign service uh, in, in the urban core and then some other. Uh, innovative approaches uh, outside the region here. So it really allows us a lot of flexibility to be able to do that. And part of the, part of the whole mission uh, of the ATA here is to look at things through a different lens. It's about, look, it, it, this is about people. It's not about inanimate objects. It's not about buses and scooters and 
whatever. To, to us, ridership is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of what kind of system can you have to where a customer has access, options, and control over their transit experience. And the more you have those three things, the more apt you are to use public transit. And if we as a transit authority can stop acting like the, the bus company of the past and quit trying to be the best blockbuster ever, then we're going to allow ourselves to do innovative approaches with public-private partnerships with other uh, city governments and county governments and able to come up with really unique perspectives and unique opportunities for, for customers all around the region. And back to what Jameson said, so the, some innovative approaches, yes, from a, from a, a mobility standpoint, but also from, from a people standpoint. Okay, we started, we started working out uh, public-private partnerships to make public transportation free for all our veterans. Once we did that, we've had over two million rides so far. We made transit free for uh, our high school kids, zero fare for our high school mm -hmm. kids in, in four different school districts. And now mm -hmm. all, all the, there's 75,000 trips there. Uh, our opportunity pass with our safety net providers, domestic violence shelters, those kinds of things, uh -huh. we're, we're already uh -huh. over 10,000. It hasn't even been a month long yet. So, yeah. yep. well, I guess that's the point. I'll stop and let you ask a question. Next slide. <laughs> No, no, that was great. So I, I, I like that line about uh, not trying to be the best blockbuster ever. Uh, I think that's one we'll have to remember. So in the efforts to not be the best blockbuster, but to actually really uh, try to think differently, you, you at KCATA have really been on the vanguard, we're going to dive into this now, of a technology that's gotten a lot more popular and got a lot more attention in the last couple of years, uh, which, is, which is microtransit. So maybe you can spend just a couple of minutes um, on, on this, help us understand what you. What I guess you've really had two pilots now, starting with Bridge and now with KC Microtransit. Uh, maybe first, just begin us with. Tell us about Bridge, how you uh, first got into it, and what you learned from it. You've applied to KC Microtransit. You really want to ask me how we still have our jobs after it, don't you? I hear it in your voice. I, I didn't. I didn't say that. I might have implied it. I didn't say it, Jameson. Go ahead. <laughs> A few years back, we really started looking at how do we become more than just a bus company and how do we deliver services in ways that are really meaningful and impactful for what people were experiencing. You know, we all carry these mobile devices in our pockets and they're more computer than phone anymore. So the on-demand economy is really smacking our face and um, delivering bus service wasn't capturing all of it. So we, we came across this idea, this concept called Bridge, actually just in New York Times, and we looked at the video, we reached out to them through their website, it was on a Friday afternoon, we had a phone call with them that Monday afternoon, we were on a plane to Boston less than two weeks later, and we experienced the service and checked it out and came back and had our planners talk to their planners, and we liked some things about what they did and how they did things differently, and we figured um, that could work in Kansas City, let's check it out, let's try it. Let's try it and see what we can learn from it. So we launched Bridge, and as you know, um, all and well, on Jameson, trips. can I just ask one clarifying question on that? Because I think people might be curious. Sure. Did you get special authority from your board to do that? It went, since Bridge was such a new service at that time. Absolutely. We, this is Robbie. Yes, we did, and uh, I believe I was was I chairman at that time. You were. Yes. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is what we were going to do and what we've done here in Kansas City in the Kansas City region, we're calling the Lord as a local call, by the way, is uh, put ourselves in a position with our mayor, our city councils, our county commissioners, as well as our board to be able to say, hey, this is where we're going to go. We're going to be innovative. We're going to try and get ahead of the curve instead of always be a little more nimble and flexible so when you turn the big battleship, by the time you get to the target, it moves. We can't do that. So what we were allowed to do from the board standpoint and then everybody else is where we're allowed to try things. And then we were allowed to fail. Okay. As long as you fail and learn from that, what's the problem with that? And I get other trends. Oh my gosh, we're not going to try that because if we fail, we may end up in a newspaper. We may end up wherever. You know what? We're going to try things and not every one of them is going to work, but Darn it, that bridge program, and he'll get more detail on it, that got us to Ride KC Freedom On Demand, uh, an Uber type mm -hmm. service within the transit agencies itself. That got us to microtransit, uh, yeah. and it's, it's been fabulous ever since. Yeah, so, yeah, well, so how did bridge go? Again. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, please. So we, we did about 1,200 trips over the year, and all 12 people that rode it loved it. 
But <laughs> and, and here, was, here, was, here was the problem with it, David. Here's what we learned. It was too hard to understand. And then it was too hard to explain. The service ran in one direction in the morning. It didn't do deadhead that same morning. There was no midday service. It only ran in one directional in the afternoon. And people thought it was cool, but didn't know who it was for. So we didn't do a very good job explaining it because it was so hard to explain. And then I think the uh, metrics of success were a little bit different between us as an authority and Bridge as a company, where you know Bridge is, is looking at um, national press and exposure uh, for VC funding. We're looking at local trips and, and how to interact. So I think that part of the, um, the, the messaging was not aligned in how we move forward. Uh, but we did learn mm -hmm. some really good things. We had uh, Cal Berkeley uh, do an analysis of that, which you can find on our website still, I believe. Um, and what we found was that the, the people who were wrote it or were asked to write it or were interested in it had an uh, income of over $70,000 a year, which is a mm. completely different market than uh -huh. a traditional transit. So we always felt that there was another market for us to re-enter uh, that arena with microtransit. But prior mm -hmm. to doing that, we wanted to come back and focus on some of the other uh, shortcomings of Bridge. Uh, one, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't accessible. We had two MV1 uh, vehicles that we would press into action if needed. Um, but, you know, we, we had to have a separate call center and we had to reverse engineer how that process would work. So what we then decided to do was say, how do I, how do I uh, design a, a program or a service that has our folks with diverse abilities as the core? Because if we can meet those needs, then we can expand that to meet general public needs. Mm -hmm. Jameson, can I talk on that? Absolutely. Okay. Hey, David, don't, I'm going to go, and you're going to say, mm, mm, which means you're going to try and get me to be quiet. But just let me talk for just a minute, all right? They, 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 what that allowed us to do is it allowed us to, you know, somebody wrote an article once in a blog said some uh, bridge to nowhere, okay, and then talked about the failure of a bridge program and can't see whatever. We call it a bridge to freedom because what it allowed us to do is think about how we can interact with an uh, Uber and microtransit type system with the actual transit system itself. So we created Ride KC On Demand, a public-private partnership with TransDev. And what, what that allowed us to do is folks like myself – and we, we do say diverse ability around here. Nobody has a disability. We have a diverse ability. And, and what we did is design it with the cornerstone of our folks with diverse abilities first. So not only did they have the standard pair of transit service, but now they had this premium Ride KC Freedom on demand service, which they could use at any time. And it's working fantastic. And it's given us a, a lot more room, as he said, other than bridge, where mobility for folks with their disability, diverse abilities was, was not very good. Uh, and by allowing us to do that, uh, we are now offering, obviously, uh, uh, the public transit system itself, fixed route, is, is free. You have tra paratransit service, so now Ride KC Freedom On Demand. I would put our uh, uh, service up for folks with diverse abilities is some of the best in the nation with with the most options. Okay. Well, well. So, so the bridge, the bridge pilot ended when? Was it 2017? Is that right? Yes, 2017, and then we Great. launched uh, Ride Free On Demand, and then we fought some more and landed on working with Transloc to launch the microtransit project that currently exists in Johnson County. Right, and how did Transloc end up on your radar screen? Um, they yeah, they approached us. They came through our um. Part of part of what came out of the bridge was us being able to put in a um, unsolicited proposal policy. So they came they came through that mechanism, and then we met with them at the APTA conference down in Atlanta a couple of years back, and started looking at different service areas. And Johnson County was the one to step up and say, you know what, we think this matches our our um, citizens and will work well here. Great. So tell us about what the service is like with KC Microtransit, because it launched earlier this year, right? And it's been it's expanded since then. 
Yeah, hi, this is Josh Powers from Johnson County. That's correct. The service started in January of this year, and the, the thing to really understand was what Jameson talked out talked about at the beginning was that you know Johnson County is one of seven jurisdictions under the Ride KC banner, and so uh, one thing that that Robbie has always been really uh, at the forefront of is you know tell us what works in your area. So you know, we're a 500 square mile county with 600,000 residents, so we're not very dense. So fixed route service is difficult uh, once you start looking at ways to provide uh, transit service that's not commuter-based. And, and Kansas City is an interesting uh, metropolitan area because it's a metro that is uh, comprised of a state line with two states. You've got Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and then uh, you know 20 cities in Johnson County. We don't recognize that state line. I mean, people cross across our state line to get to work and fun and medical appointments every single day. So in the county, what we're looking at is basically innovative ways to solve the first and last mile problem. You know, in Johnson County, our transit service is fairly limited. Most of our uh, routes are hour headways, and people might have to walk as much as a mile to get to a stop. So microtransit was really looked at uh, both as a, uh, you know, mobility as a service uh, preference for folks in the county who want that on-demand immediate response, as well as to open up access to fixed route service uh, to folks who might have otherwise not been able to access it. So uh, began in January. We uh, had initially had a six-month pilot to get us through June. The Board of County Commissioners authorized that pilot to be extended uh, through the end of this year, and we are operating uh, four vehicles in service in about a 40 square mile service area, and to date we've provided almost 18,000 rides uh, through that service. So, can you walk through the user experience? So, if I'm within that that area that, it, that that's available, but by the way, first of all, I should just clarify: both my origin and destination have to be within that area. Is that right? That's correct. It's geographically limited because obviously, you know, the longer the trips get, the, the more expensive and more difficult it's, uh, that service is to uh, uh, to to provide. So I'm going to uh, turn over to Lisa Womack. She's going to tell you a little bit about the experience. So, yep, Great. this is Lisa. So the way that it works is um, right now we have a mobile app where we have a an online interface or customers can also call in. As long as they're inside of that service area, they call in during our normal business hours. And we actually, um, Josh didn't mention, but we extended not only the um, service area, but we also added Saturday service in when we made that extension and got the approval to continue with the pilot. So we now have Saturday hours as well. The so customers um, set up the ride through one of those three mechanisms, and the vehicle is actually it's a curb-to-curb -curb service, which is a little bit different from Bridge as well. Bridge had sort of a meet at a meeting point, and we'll give it to you, whereas this we're doing curb-to-curb. And I might just jump in real quick. This is Josh again, just to mention, uh, thanks to Lisa for pointing out that that expansion is the second part of the pilot. Uh, that might be interesting to listeners because in the county, we have been the provider of, of transportation service for 40 years, uh, you know, prior to our collaboration uh, coordination with Ride KC. Uh, but that Saturday service was really driven through a partnership through one of our largest cities who came to us and the first time of our history wanted to help subsidize this new service. So for us, it gets back to that public-private partnership and looking for partners in getting better mobility access to residents. Okay. And in terms of ridership, you mentioned earlier that I believe that the bridge pilot, which I believe went over a year, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, moved around 1,200 people. How is ridership looking with uh, with with this program? So we've done 18, we've done about 18,000 trips to date. So that's a little bit more than our bridge, 1,200. <laughs> we our average daily. Yeah, and, trip, and in less time. <laughs> This is Josh. We do uh, about 109 trips on average a day. Uh, our peak has been, I think, 150. Yep, 150. Days. And so we're on track to, to get to 30,000 rides in a year. So, I mean, it, it's been more successful than I think we even hoped. And, David, what we're doing now from a system-wide standpoint is taking what we're learning, obviously, from the Johnson County microtransit uh, pilot, and then adding that to our thoughts when we talk about we're in the middle of a system-wide redesign in the Kansas City region, and then how microtransit can fit into the rest of the region too, so that the next mountain we climb can be connecting, uh, not just in, in Josh's specific, uh, specific region. 
Are, are you maxed out now on ridership? What's the constraint if you're at 100 to 150 people per day? What would it take to take that to 200, 300? So I don't want to say that we're maxed out. We have three three very large peaks throughout the day where we are a little maxed out, and our and our wait time is, um, is pretty extensive. It can be pretty extensive for some customers. We have a large service area for this um, pilot. So right now, we're actually we have a couple taxis that we're using as backup in the service area. I think if we got to two or three hundred trips a day, we'd probably have some different conversations internally because we would absolutely probably need another vehicle or three in the service area. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting, uh, for transit agencies to look at, it's interesting to try to look at the service because, you know, we're so used to looking at fixed route bus ridership and paratransit ridership, and this is kind of a different, while you can compare it, it's a, it's a completely different service. It appeals to some of the same customers, but it's brought, I believe it's brought some latent demand in for people who have never ridden public transit because it's kind of an ideal system. Hey, so David, it's David, interesting. David. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What, one of the other pieces is that each of the pilots have been iterative. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the Northland is um, how, do we, how do we focus on jobs access? Because um, in that part of the in that part of our service service area, they source a lot of their employees from the urban core. So we're really looking at how do we make a stronger tie-in between um, our fixed route usage in that area and microtransit, and that can be done a, a couple of different ways. But we're that's what we're taking a hard look at right now. So I'm, you just brought up fixed route, which is something I wanted to ask about, because uh, oftentimes with with microtransit, which is still a new service. There's uh, one of the arguments for it is that it's cheaper to provide by the transit agency. And I'm curious if that's been your experience, uh, because critics of microtransit sometimes say, well, the variable cost of providing a service is often mainly labor. Um, so th they question whether there's that much of a cost savings. So what's been your experience? Is it cheaper than fixed route? And if so, why? Well, and how much? Well, it depends, right? It depends. So the area I just talked about in the Northland, for them to have a successful fixed route, they have to do a ton of infrastructure work. There are no sidewalks. There are narrow roads. There are no good access to the workplaces that where we would have to get to. And in fact, we've tried it with fixed route bus service before. And as Robbie likes to say, it would have been cheaper to send a limo to pick up all eight of the people that rode the service every day. So when you huh. look at um, when you look at microtransit and you're comparing costs and you're comparing subsidy for cost, you have to factor in those other costs, right? And I know people say, oh, those are capital versus operational. They're costs yet and still. And, you know, when we look at what the cost overall for Johnson County to do their microtransit service versus what it is to put a fixed route in, mm -hmm. they'd be throwing good money after bad. If they do you have any of those numbers, Jameson? No, I'm just curious. I'm sorry. I was just wondering, do you know the, the subsidy per rider? I think that would be interesting to folks for microtransit. Um, do, you, do you know what it is right now for the program? This is Josh from the county. Uh, yeah, currently it's 2118 a ride. And it, our lowest uh, subsidy cost per ride in this program was around $17. And that was before we added a fourth vehicle. So like Jameson said, you know, where's your cost? It's the labor, it's the vehicle, uh, adding that extra driver for a time. Now, one thing I'll point out, Jameson's exactly right. Um, the vehicles that we're using, which are Ford Transit, we have uh, seven passenger, 10 passenger, and 15 passenger vehicles. You know, they cost 10% of, of a 40 or 30 or 40 foot bus. You think about fuel consumption, uh, it, it's about 10% of the fuel cost as well. So you have to keep those factors in mind as well. But the most interesting thing that we've seen is that, in, from my perspective, uh, when I have to justify this back to our Board of County Commissioners, um, we have two key corridors, a, a north, south, and east-west corridor. Ridership on those two key corridors are up 25% since we started the microtransit pilot. People are taking the service because it's geographically limited to get to fixed route service to get further to their destination. So uh, we, we really were afraid that we'd be cannibalizing our own riders from fixed route, but that's mm -hmm. not how it's played out. And, just to and actually we should note, I was gonna say, we've made it attractive to encourage the fixed route ridership by 
um, accepting the passes that we accept on our fixed drop buses, we accept on our microtransit, we offer transfers as an incentive for people who are using the fixed drop because of the, the way that the county's laid out and it's spread out so well, so that way people can use microtransit to get to the fixed drop services as well. And Lisa, the transfers are free, is that right? It's a dollar fifty fare yeah. that involves includes a free transfer, if I'm not mistaken. They are absolutely free. And if you're participating in a program currently that's on fixed route, if you're a veteran using your free fare pass on the fixed route buses, we're accepting that on microtransit as well, currently, for the okay. pilot. Well, I've met, I've, there's lots more we can talk about, but I, I want to make sure we get questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask one last one, which is always one I want to make sure we fit in. Which, And in this case, you know, microtransit is a topic that I think is getting an increasing amount of attention from other agencies across North America. So I would say based on your experience, not just with KC Microtransit, but also with Bridge, what are a couple do's and a couple don't's for other agencies that want to do this? Or want to well, explore the, doing uh, First of all, uh, I just, I, I do believe that from a transit agency standpoint, we just, we just have to look at, step through the looking glass here and quit thinking like the transit agencies of 30 years ago and think about transit agencies for the next 20. Uh, fact of the matter is, it's not just microtransit, it's not just fixed route. Normally, we get in these discussions where it's one versus the other, right? It's streetcar versus bus, bus versus microtransit, microtransit versus Uber. As we said a long time ago, there, there's room in the tent for everybody, and it's your job as a transit agency. We're not in a profit business. It's your job to help connect the dots. And if the more options and the more access and the more control you can give customers, your ridership will then come. And David, this is Josh from the county. I think that one thing that I'd impart uh, as the policy person looking at this is every community is different. And Robbie's been really clear on that. One size doesn't fit all. You can run a microtransit pilot a number of different ways. You could have zones. You could have uh, zone pricing. You can do a whole bunch of different things that, that we haven't done to date because uh, we think we understand our riding community. We think we understand what folks expect as far as access to transportation. This is, we're in the Midwest. In, in the suburban Midwest, you're fighting an uphill battle uh, with folks who have multiple cars in some cases, and uh, a little less access makes that barrier uh, that much difficult, more difficult to overcome. So know your, your ridership. Know your rider base and, and try to understand how a service like this can meet them where they are instead of continuing to, to try to do the same thing, you know, again and again. That's great, Josh. And if you just put if, – if you put at the front end of this whole conversation – that you as a transit agency need to become flexible and nimble and develop a process through which your board and your stakeholders understand that it's okay to be innovative. It's okay to run pilot programs to see if they work. It's okay to do those kind of things. That can help you get a, get a lot further. All right. Well, why don't we put a bookmark there because I know I'm, we're getting questions from the audience. Can I turn things over to you, Petra? To to, uh, to to ask some? Absolutely. And uh, in fact, I have my colleague here, Mark Gazzetti, who's our Vice President of Policy and Mobility at APTA, and he has been fielding questions uh, from, from all of you, and he's got a few ready to uh, ask of KCATA and Johnson County. So I'll hand the word to Art. And thank you, Petra. And as uh, questions come in, the many are of uh, a common theme, so we bundle them together and, and we're trying our best to do that. So uh, some questions coming in just about the sort of the, the geography of your service area. So I'll, I'll bundle a few together. Uh, about how many square miles are those zones? Uh, do you have anchor points? Uh, how do you handle walk-up customers? And how many vehicles in a uh, service area and the operating hours of the vehicle. So a bunch of questions there, but I think there's a common theme. So the current service area is about 42 square miles. We have eight vehicles. We usually deploy four of those vehicles at a time. What were the other parts of those questions? We handle walk-up customers the same. Um, the wa mm -hmm. Walk-up customers are handled the same. They can walk up and the drivers can input them into their tablets. Our service hours are Monday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. And, and one point also to clarify, um, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you can hail a trip 
from an app as well as from the web. Is that correct? Or via phone, perhaps? All three, yeah. On the app, on a, mobile, on a web page, it was portal, and on the phone. Yeah, it's impressive. Uh, th this question just in, but I'm going to ask it and go back to some of the other ones. Uh, do you get an approximate arrival time at the time you're requesting a ride, and do you know how long it will take you to get there? You do get, this is Josh from the county, you do get an approximate uh, wait time. Our average wait time is between 15 and 18 minutes. As Lisa said, in some of the peaks, it is longer, and it kind of depends, obviously, on how those uh, uh, trips come in. Um, one of the things that we faced as working with Transloc, which they have been a great partner in this, is trying to understand how the algorithm works with pairing people onto rides and then uh, uh, scheduling those rides. Because what we don't want is for that wait time to change while a person's waiting and looking at it. You know, you, you book your trip and it says, well, it'll be there in 15 minutes, and in 12 minutes that changes to 20 minutes, and at 20 minutes it changes a little further. That's been one of the technical challenges that we've been trying to work through with, with Transload because we want that we want to stick to that, that an original uh, notice that you get that says your ride will be here in X amount of minutes. That sounds like a pressure that's familiar to many of us that have taken Uber or Lyft. <laughs> A, a, a quick question, and then uh, go into a, a different line here, perhaps. Uh, but you mentioned the fare cost, I think, is one a dollar fifty. Is that the same as the bus, or is there any differentiation? So that is same, the, the same, same as the bus. As our, it's the same as the bus, and that's for the pilot period. You know, this is we do consider this to be a, a more premium service, and so there are questions that the board of county commissioners will have to adjudicate for us uh, as far as fare policy. Uh, we like to think that the direction we're headed is that the, the fare would stay at $1.50 if you're using it to get to fixed route service, but if you use it as a curb-to-curb -curb or door-to-door -door service, then the fare would be higher. And that, That's a question that we wanted to answer through the bridge program as well. We just never got the ridership to, to, <laughs> test, to test the elasticity of it. However, on the, the, the bridge program, not the bridge program, but the program that came between bridge and microtransit, our freedom on demand program, we were able to test that as well on the elasticity because that did so well. So we're looking forward to seeing what the impact is in Johnson County so that can help to inform uh, what we do in the Northland as well. You talked uh, a bit about productivity and gave some measures for that. Uh, some questions are coming in perhaps from slightly different angles, so I'll go through a few of those. Uh, you might want to quick, make quick notes. Uh, passenger trips per hour, uh, the productivity of your ADA service, uh, uh, passengers per hour, uh, uh, revenue hour uh, versus before adding the general public rides. So a difference between uh, productivity before and after. And same with subsidy. What is the subsidy? per ADA ride now versus before? Uh, series of questions. So our, pa our paratransit, and I'm going to give you approximates because I don't have that in front of me, but we're, we're approximately $45 per trip subsidized on our ADA paratransit, and our productivity has always been around between 158 and 165, somewhere in there. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of space to cover, so we don't have tight, dense uh, trips on our paratransit unless we're in the uh, urban core. So our productivity is a little lower for that type of service. In terms of our freedom on demand service, um, the subsidy on that is, is $10.50 a trip for ambulatory and $14.50 a trip for non-ambulatory. Um, and we've done well over 100,000 trips on that since the program was started. So in, in, so in developing, in taking bridge and developing first into our Ride KC Freedom On Demand uh, uh, paratransit service, what we've done is with that public-private partnership, cut our costs of uh, paratransit service, what, 30 percent? Something like that, Yeah, Jackson? about 30 percent less per trip. The productivity on microtransit is approximately two and a half trips per hour, approximately. Mm -hmm. Good. The same concept applies. So we, we use a non-dedicated fleet for that on-demand program. That's where the majority of savings is from. 
a, a question about your employees. Uh, are some of the operators coming from your fixed route driver pool, or are these third party uh, third party operators? So let me answer, let's answer that in two in two ways. So for the bridge program, we really focused on uh, people that had hospitality backgrounds. And we figured we can teach them how to drive because these were four transit vehicles. We really wanted a hospitality industry. Um, now um, we do have folks who drove bridge that are now driving a uh, fixed route. But in terms of the Johnson County uh, program, that's all private sector. And Josh can go into that. Yeah, so our, our structure might be a little opaque, but you know, basically Johnson County is a client of, of the ATA and the ATA manages our programs. But for microtransit, we utilize a company called Kansas City Transportation Group, and they also operate uh, 1010 Taxi. And that's really interesting because from a flexibility standpoint, we have this whole additional private fleet that when our peaks get our wait times get uh, uh, longer in the peaks, we can deploy private sector taxis to fill the gap without having to add a full time, you know, full shift, 14 hour shift uh, additional vehicle. Uh, so that's really been important in us being able to ha handle that peak ridership without having really outrageous wait times. Okay, so a quick follow-up question. This is David. Do your employees wear the same uniforms or outfits for microtransit as the bus drivers for fixed route? No, they have a they have a separate uniform. You think that matters? Um, it. It, it's only because it's still branded with Ride KC. It's just got different colors. So each service usually has some sort of different color scheme. So that's the only reason they're wearing um, a different color polo than we would put in a fixed drop bus driver. Yeah, really, it's a marketing situation. You, you want your customer to be able to to identify the different services uh, based on those that branding aspect of it. But they still know it's one Ride KC yeah. brand, right? So, David, something interesting. Um, we we just had a study a study done by by a local company here. And one of the uh, findings was that our customers feel safer with a person of authority that has Ride KC on their jacket than with a police officer. And that translates even to our uh, Freedom on Demand program, where we've heard that people in our outer ring suburbs are uh, more comfortable riding on our service because they know it's associated with the authority than with a Lyft or an Uber. So having the different services uh, branded differently but co-branded helps to add to the value of the Ride KC brand. Absolutely. Uh, more questions than we're going to have time to address. I think we have time maybe for one more. And I'm going to ask you, you made reference to, uh, was, was it an opportunity pass uh, or innovation pass opportunity? Uh, and you know, what equipment is on board to receive uh, the fare? for that well right now we just make passes we make hard passes and with our school kids our veterans and with our opportunity pass participants through the health forward foundation you just take that pass and you swipe it as you as you get on the vehicle so if you're talking about on the microtransit vehicle they're just using it as a flash pass that's another that's another interesting thing that we're working out is how do you uh, how do you manage all the passes on, on a microtransit vehicle? And, and eventually, David, we're not going to need any of that because we're going to go to fare zero. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about that, that at another. Uh, there, Robbie, that, that's a good teaser for a future webinar there. I think you're uh, on to something uh, of great interest there. Petra. And that's a good segue for me to uh, say that uh, Robbie and Jameson, I believe, from KCATA will be in New York in mid-October, uh, as well as David Zipper and uh, others here. So there will be an opportunity uh, to, to uh, engage with them more, and there will be plenty of sessions that are focusing on these topics uh, at, at our Transform Conference, which is from October 13 through 16 in New York City. So please do check that out on the APTA website. But most of all, I would like to thank today's speakers, uh, David Zipper, Robbie Mackinnon, Jameson Otten, Lisa Womack, and Josh Powers for a really exciting and engaging conversation. And we also like to thank uh, our audience for your participation and some very good questions. Uh, once again, uh, I'd like to let you know to please keep your calendars open for the next round of webinars. 
which will be announced in October. And make sure to regularly check the After You and Mobility Innovation Hub websites for upcoming events. And thank you again very much. Thank, thank you. you.